Okay, hello everyone. Pleasure to be here with all of you today. I'm Diego Ponce de Leon. I'm the head of technology at Eva Community Energy. And uh, with me is Kevin Lee, my colleague, principal data scientist at Eva, um, working on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this presentation hopefully will be a, a way in which we can engage and hi Justin. Um, we can ask uh, questions and participate and just, uh, if possible, have a conversation, but you're also welcome to answer, ask questions at the very end. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my background. I'll talk about a company I founded after I left UC Berkeley, and then we'll talk together with Kevin about the work that we do at, at AVA. So I'll start. Um, just you never know, I went to a high school that's international. I went in Wales to the United World College of the Atlantic. And there's a set of schools all around the world that uh, I have pleasure to make friends with. Many, many kids who went there and now they're all over the world, but one of you might have gone to those high schools and you never know, that's why I always put it there. Then I went to Macalester and the U of M to study economics and civil engineering. And this was a long time ago now that I, I went to college, but it was projects that took me to uh, different countries in East Africa and Central America to do development engineering work, mainly around water, but also in development of microgrids. So a long time ago was really when I began my work in energy for the provision and uh, uh, sustainable resource management. Um, then for work, after I graduated, I started uh, different sort of work experiences that uh, were involved with uh, MIT Poverty Action Lab. Uh, also in Latin America, with some work in different parts of India doing research on hydrogeology and how droughts affected um, the power grid and affected uh, the lo different local economies of two different regions in India. And then uh, I graduated during one of the worst recessions uh, that the U.S. has had, but I was lucky enough to have a job at a small boutique financial uh, advising firm, which taught me that I never want to do that again. So I did that <laughs> and I quickly left it. Um, but this experience got me on the journey of really understanding the usefulness and the power of data to address sustainability issues and slowly working towards uh, understanding uh, sustainable energy and clean energy and concepts uh, related to that. After that experience, I went to the energy and resources group that some of you might know because you're very close by at UC Berkeley. And there I began really questioning some assumptions about how we're going to transition to a renewable and clean energy future with some of the slides I'll be presenting. And how do you think about conceptually a global energy transition? Which countries uh, can participate in, the, in that transition? Which ones cannot? Um, and then if we, all those countries can participate and all those populations can participate, how can they participate equitably in that transition? So I was exploring concepts related to that research. And a lot of that work was funded, some of it by UC Berkeley, some of it by the Inter-American Development Bank, which is the Latin American branch of the World Bank, um, or somehow related, um, IBM that has their Smart Cities Lab in Nairobi, in Kenya, and then uh, National Geographic, which at the time when I was in grad school, had something that they called the National Geographic Energy Challenge Grant. And this is a grant that they had opened for a couple of years where they gave 50, 40 ground, grants around the world to fund research that was, uh, or and projects that were directly related to energy transitions in different environments around the world. So, um, I would encourage you folks to go to uh, National Geographic website. They always have RFPs for grants that you might have access to in the different areas that you do research in. And also the Inter-American Development Bank, because they usually have consultancies or they have projects that you might be able to contribute you with, you with your expertise. Um, and IBM has these interesting labs around the world, and of course, Berkeley, but you're at Stanford. So. And then after I graduated, I spent about three years with a company that I started uh, right after I, I started the company during grad school, and then I kept doing it for three years afterwards. And I'll talk a little bit about those challenges and how I transitioned from academia to entrepreneurship, and then the challenges that that conveyed and the timing. And now uh, the current role that I've been now at, at Ava Community Energy, which I've been now for a little bit over four years. 
Um, and I really enjoy it. But I'll pass it on for Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't have as exciting a background as Diego. Um, started with a, a statistics degree from Berkeley. Um, and then from there, jumped into Microsoft, but it's and it's a very pro-establishment um, type of background. But I like to think that I got through into these um, companies through the back door. Um, actually joined a startup that was acquired by Microsoft after two months of joining. Um, and this was more focused on online advertising analytics. So completely opposite from sustainability and energy. But um, it taught me a lot about business um, and, and kind of questions that um, the industry is looking to, to answer and that's important to them. And it also gave, gave me um, experience working with real world data. Um, and so after about four years of online advertising, it was pretty soul sucking. Um, and that inspired me to go back to my master's in something that was more um, near and dear to my heart, which is um, energy and, and sustainability. Um, um, I had my MS in um, CMU. Um, and then after that, joined another big company, but through through kind of uh, the startup, through a startup that they acquired, again, um, similar um, similar path as the earlier Microsoft, um, is one that created uh, analytics software for utilities. Um, spent about five years there and kind of got to know the industry uh, well and saw how they operated and saw kind of the inefficiencies of, of the existing utility industry. Um, and that prompted me to then move to uh, a community choice aggregator, which kind of represents um, a startup version of, of a utility or their startup counterpart and allows us the flexibility to um, design solutions, novel solutions to the utility space. Great. Thank you. So I'll start with a few of the questions that motivated some of my research while, while I was at Berkeley in terms of understanding uh, global energy transitions. And when at least I, when I was in grad school, and maybe some people might still think about transitions this way, with I think about rich countries investing a lot of money into their energy transition. And this is usually what comes to mind, at least to me, when I think about energy transitions. So I gathered uh, a bunch of disparate data sets, global data sets related to income, to uh, democracy, related to political efficiency, related to poverty and income. And I want to understand, is it true that the richest countries are moving faster than other countries? So you can't see all, all the numbers here, but I'll walk you through them. These are the many countries around the world ranked from the ones that are making the most progress according to the income group that they belong in terms of how rapidly they're making progress since the 1980s. So this graph, the y-axis is percentage change in non-hydro renewable energy since 1980. According to the, the income group, is, uh, they're clustered by the income group and the colors are the regions. So the countries here on the left, the first one is Denmark, the second one is Nicaragua, then Kenya, Lithuania, and Costa Rica. And then on the spectrum, you have some European countries. I think the United States is around here. And then you have some other countries like Cameroon, Belize, um, Norway is one of the least, the countries that have made the least progress in that aspect. And this is really interesting to me because Nicaragua in the Western hemisphere is the third poorest country in our continent. Right? And it's not the country that we think about when we think about transitions to renewable energy. Costa Rica is definitely way up there. They have a, they've made a lot of progress. And when I began looking at this data and to exploring what was happening around the world, the next question that came up to me is, we hear a lot about the massive investments in infrastructure that we're going to have to do to bring in solar and wind. And if there's countries already making a lot of progress, how are they doing it 
having a much smaller budget than the United States and countries in Europe, for example. So this is like a premise what I was thinking about transitions and, and how we're doing and, and where are we going. Another graph that sort of challenges these assumptions of that leads to me, how you, do you achieve a, a global energy transition? So again, this on the right, on, on the x-axis is the number of pro-renewable energy, energy policies passed since the 1970s by all countries around the world. And then again, the percentage change in non-hydro renewables since uh, 1980. And then countries, some countries that really believe in policies and really have efficient uh, institutions, they might pass a lot of policies. You have the US over here on the right, you have Australia, you have China here, um, you have some other European countries, you have Mexico there. So they pass a lot of policies, but in terms of the percentage change, it's you don't see a clear color correlation in these things. Again, you have Denmark all the way over here, you have Nicaragua, you have Kenya, Nicaragua passing no policies and making a lot of progress. They have a, a, a terrible dictator as a, as a president, very oppressive. It's Kenya, they have Iceland, Lithuania, all over the place, right? Um, so this has the other question is okay. So if we can overemphasize in policies and really pass policies for decarbonization, and we have agreements like the Paris Agreement that says we must have agreements, we must have policies. But then we have some data that may suggest, hey, countries are not only motivated by passing policies. There might be other motivations that we have to tap into for this to enable. So this was part of the research that, that exploratory projects that I did while I was in grad school. Um, and then asking these sort of questions on transitions and how they happen took me on some unpredictable routes. And I think that unpredictable route, I didn't imagine that I was going to be spending some time collaborating with the IBM uh, Smart Cities Lab in Nairobi. And that was a really interesting lab because they were using uh, cutting edge technology that they had at their fingertips, Watson, a bunch of other technologies that they have available to really try to solve some challenges related to education, to healthcare, to water access, to energy using the computer power that they have on hand. So in particular, the project that I was working uh, uh, with IBM collaborating on was a project on how do you bring electricity to the vast amount of people who don't have electricity in East Africa? And then to plan an electric grid you have, or to bring electricity, you have a different choices in which you can do. You have microgrids, you have distributed this uh, energy resources like panels or batteries, or you have the grid. Regardless of which, choi which choice of electrification you choose, you need to know what electricity demand will be so you can plan for it, right? Regardless of the strategy. But what do you do when you don't have a baseline for electricity consumption? So this was a data mining project in which we used census data to understand how the path of electrification changes energy consumption. So for example, these small graphs that you can't see very well here, you have electricity access, zero to 100. It's very small, I'm sorry. And then the penetration of a particular appliance. This small one is mobile phones, completely uncoordinated. You don't really need to have electricity access to have mobile access. A lot of people around the world use phones and they don't have electricity. Solar panels is the same, right? You can own PV without having access to the grid. But then other things like televisions, um, radios um, are, uh, televisions are really related to that, but radios are not. You can have radios on batteries. You can have radios on, on different, different ways of, of charging your radio. And also the refrigerator wasn't really well co correlated with that because there might be just one shop in the town that has the one refrigerator. So combining disparate data sets, census, surveys, some spatial uh, data of night uh, lights, how people use electricity at night that allows you to map how uh, lights look like throughout a country, gives you a sense of the latent energy demand. So what will electricity demand be once you build a microgrid, once you build a transmission line? And this is really critical for countries like Kenya that need to apply for funds to get hundreds of millions of dollars to build their infrastructure. 
So the, com the combination of these data sets is really important for, that's part of the research that I did during my PhD. But I also did it for the same approach I was doing it in Nicaragua. But in Nicaragua, I took a different approach in which not only did we have survey data, social demographic data, but part of the project was to use sensor networks to get different load signals from different devices, cell phones, refrigerators, television, washing machines, fans, to understand how the load looks like during the day and how much of the total load are different appliances. So, and these two countries are similar in income, but they're in different stages of development. This country has over 85% of its population connected to the grid. This one has very few of them. Both of them are in a path of really high rapid and energy transition. So this research was mainly focused on what are the strategies for energy efficiency that this country can have? Which lows currently exist in the home and when they can, do they consume energy so we can use them for demand response program? At any given time in Nicaragua, and I'll walk to the, so I'll walk to the next part of the research, which is once we had an understanding of what appliances are in the home, um, and I think Luke, you might have been involved in this project, right? Luke was an, uh, uh, a collaborator in, I think, this particular project while I was a grad student at UC Berkeley. Uh, a great job. Um, so the at any point in time in Nicaragua, if you look at generation, 60% of total generation was coming from wind alone. Right, and that is, that is huge compared to what most countries in the world, of course, it's a tiny country. The reason why Nicaragua was able to do it without batteries is because they have a really well-organized interconnection that goes all the way from Panama to Southern Mexico. So all the countries in Central America have this really nice interconnection, which is really balancing, doing a different, different types of resources in the grid. But the question that I have is, batteries are gonna be really expensive for these countries that are low income, but they have um, a lot of renewables already. What existing loads do we have in the grid in, inside people's homes um, that we can activate to help renewables coming to the grid? So this was a project that was multidimensional in, in the sense of, do people wanna participate in these programs? Most of these homes are really low income and they, there is a certainly in Shantita. What is the motivation to participate in a smart grid project? Are they interested? What are the telecommunication technologies that we should use to send signals when uh, power might be out in the country? What are and this, asking yourselves all these questions is really useful because a lot of countries around the world will have to answer these types of questions to enable their low carbon transition. So truly what we were doing is we had a few models one model that was doing a day ahead forecast of electricity demand, a hours ahead model of electricity demand in the country. Um, there was a design choice on how households like their information to be communicated. Do they like an email? Do they like a text message? Should we be using Facebook? Should we be using WhatsApp? What is the best way in which you can communicate to people? It turns out that in some countries like Nicaragua and Kenya, Facebook and internet plans are free, right? So if you can tap out into already free existing ways in which you send information, it's really useful to make a technology that is will be adapted by the people you're, you're working with. And then finally, the signals that go on back uh, to the loads to be controlled. In this particular case, we were working mainly with refrigerators and homes and small businesses. And that's what, what I'm holding in my hand here. This is um, called the Flexbox. And the Flexbox, what it was really was a Raspberry Pi and a shield that you connected all these different sensors. It was it had a couple, couple of thermocouples that would go inside the fridge. It had a ambient temperature sensor and it had a motion sensor and a modem that we used to send signals back and forth for controlling the load. So the idea was that we would learn the patterns of behavior of the household and small businesses and engage with the fridge at times where we needed to recruit it for a particular action. It could have been for uh, making sure that we could shed load at a particular point in time, 
And the reason we chose fridge is because this curve that you see here, this is the fridge. The fridge in some of these homes was like 70% of the load, right? So there's no reason why you should be shedding load on your entire neighborhood if you could just be recruiting refrigerators at a particular time to participate in some market action. Um, and we also did some household power mon uh, metering, uh, control using uh, smart plugs, and we installed the weather station so we had a better sense of what was happening. Um, so a few of the things, before I move to this slide, there's a lot of lessons in terms of how to motivate people to participate in a smart grid pilot that I learned from this. One of them was that financial motivation was, a, was not the most important motivation for these households to collaborate with us. We were providing monthly reports to them, but also text messages in which we could engage them to tell them, hey, your energy consumption is too high, or you can opt out of participating in this flexible demand event. And for the most part, it was women who would be in the household during the day. They would just be with their children or taking care of the business. And what they communicated to us was that this information allowed them to make better decisions inside the home for negotiating with their husbands on how to make decisions inside the home, but also to ma better manage uh, their energy consumption without the within the house, which is a far significant amount uh, of money that's spent in energy there than is spent in here. So it was really important for them. And then the experiment continued and we asked them, you can choose to continue the experiment and you can choose either incentives uh, with money, we, we paid them for the amount of times that they participated in the grid, or you can continue receiving your information. And most people opted out of receiving money and they just wanted to keep receiving the information so they could better manage their business or their home. So in terms of the lessons that I took with me uh, from these pilot projects was that um, pilots are really important. So pilots, real world pilots working with people are critical for informing best practices of how to roll out big programs. Um, that doing pilots can allow you to learn how you can leapfrog decades of technology investments that you don't need to make. Um, that data is really useful for planning and that most smart grid pilots should be co-designed with users instead of you designing them at the utility level because you have an insight into how well they'll be received and how scalable your solution is. Now working at Ava, we don't, we don't do that top-down design, but we do really make an effort to involve the community in the design so we can be successful at scaling solutions. Um, and finally, just uh, this will allow you to understand new business models and challenges that exist to tap into different entrepreneurship opportunities that might uh, arise as you are uncovering and doing pilots and learning from this. So now, after I graduated, so the... I, I started a company called Sinampa that was focusing on really tapping into this huge opportunity that I saw for flexible demand in the space. But I think it was an idea that was definitely ahead of its time because the markets were not there for these loads to participate and do arbitrage and just be paid for what they were doing. So I pivoted and I focused mainly on helping address the data gap that existed to enable this market to arise. So. There were three products that came out of uh, Sinampa. One of them was a platform that truly was a platform for all of Latin America, all the way to Argentina and Brazil, for a platform where people could come in and have access to market uh, high resolution data, 15 minute interval data, hourly data, uh, maps, location of power stations, uh, all over Latin America. The second one was, I believe, the first API in the region, set similar to my green button that exists in California, where a household can opt in and give different DER providers access to their home level data through an API. So this was used by energy efficiency providers all over Mexico and solar providers to understand their customer bills and be able to make offers to them. And the final one was this other one called uh, energiaapi.org, 
And it was mainly this version, but in API form, providing open access data to the region throughout Latin America. And in a sense, it was a success because while I did not start in the initial idea of flexible demand, I was able to work with all over Latin America, in East Africa, in Southeast Asia, with international government agencies that needed this sort of data to make plans on how to invest in these countries in the future. If you don't have bottom-up baseline energy demand, it's really hard for you to plan how to build an electric grid. It's hard to know how much, how big of a loan you should be giving to a country. And it's hard for entrepreneurs to plan how to participate in a market. So that was really useful. And I think the other really uh, exciting part of, of, of having the company in this time period was that it, I started to realize all the different opportunities to, to collaborate with international agencies. The other one that was a lot of fun to collaborate with was the Global Cooling Project, which is a spin-off of the Kigali Initiative which is the new version of what the Copenhagen Protocol was in the 1970s to address CFCs. And with them, what I was working with was creating baseline, uh, uh, baseline data for the, city, for the hottest cities in Latin America to a baseline for how warming is gonna affect households across the region with the projections that we have for climate change so that they can uh, draft and create uh, action plans and policies and loan mechanisms for energy efficiency and for how to design architecture and homes for the future. So I, I did this for about three years. I really liked it. And then the end of Sinapa came when I, I was mainly doing consulting, hustling for three years, but then the time came to do my, my, my first seed round. And I was in this spot where I was working in countries that VCs in the Bay Area, are sort of scared of, oh, like Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Central America, very risky, very risky versus making investments in these regions. And in Mexico, where there's a lot of VC firms, they didn't understand the value of sensor networks and machine learning then, right? So this was a few years ago now. I think it could be a different story right now, but it was in this spot where I couldn't raise money from Mexico because they didn't really understand why I should be using ML for energy. And in the US raising money here, they found the region that I was working on too risky with too many questions to take the bet. So uh, the company was actually about to be uh, semi-acquired into Schneider Electric on a program that they have for small companies that are in their space. And they were de delaying a lot with the back and forth in the negotiations. And in the meantime, I saw the job opening at Eva Community Energy and I applied for the job. And then, uh, while I was receiving the job, the job offer at Ava, Schneider Electric was delaying too much into telling me whether I was going to be part of their company or not. And I pulled the plug and I went to travel for a couple of months and then started working at Ava. And at Ava, the pandemic started right as I started working. So it turned out to be a good decision for me because it would have been awful to have a startup during the pandemic. And it was really good to start working at, at Ava. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we still have some time, right? Like 20 minutes? I'll move quickly so we have that. So I'll now move to Ava and the work we do there. And what is data for community energy, right? So Ava, are you familiar with a community choice aggregator of what it is? Essentially what it is, to me at least, is a data company that sits on top of the pg and &E infrastructure and has more aggressive plans for clean energy. Uh, we invest in our own projects, we build them, we buy clean energy, we get PPAs, and then we have to invest a large amount of profits from the sales of energy into the community. So it's a really proactive approach and a really nice way in which utilities are managed. How does this look like in practice? Um, to make a beautiful image like this in the future that we'll hopefully see able to see one day, um, you have to get data from all sorts of sources, generation data from solar farms, from wind farms, from ge uh, geothermal plants. You need city data, social demographic data, um, billing data, interval data. You need data from DARES. You need weather data. You need market data and more. So this is what our team does. Our team is in the Google Cloud Platform and Salesforce, 
And we, every piece of energy data under the sun that you can imagine is what we process on a daily basis. And what do we use it for? We use it for helping our colleagues design transition away from natural gas into fully electrified kitchens, into increasing them the penetration of theirs, Planning, I think currently we're planning the largest, the largest incentive and lending program of e-bikes in the US. Income more programs for, for uh, customers that can't afford the electricity bill and data-driven energy efficiency programs across the Alameda County and San Joaquin County. How does it look, this nice graph also look like in practice, right? It's messy, like all of you work with data, raw, horrible CSV, PDF files, APIs from, dozens of different partners, um, back and forth with implementation partners, Camus Energy, Recurve, Cernron, many others. And then cleaning all this data in the Google Cloud Platform, providing it to our colleagues to do analytics, which Kevin will talk about, and then providing it to our colleagues at Eva, who then use these numbers to work their magic to make sure that we have are working towards our commitment of 100% um, clean energy by 2030. So I'll stop here. I know, a couple more slides and then I'll give it to Kevin. I'll go quicker. So what is the role of analytics in what we do? What types of things do we build? We're about to release this open source tool for community choice aggregators to uh, target their customers at the SIP code level using some of the data that we have. We build dashboards using Looker for our internal customers. We use tools for, for uh, data access and marketing that GCP and Salesforce make readily available to us. A lot of modeling optim optimization of theirs, batteries, um, how it should EVs should be behaving in the grid, and a lot of APIs with everyone we work with. And I think one of the things that wasn't emphasized when I was in grad school was how critical APIs are for the low carbon transition. And I have mentioned this in the past to the to the uh, deep solar project that your research is really interesting, but for practitioners like us, having access to an API where your research is available to us as a public agency is really critical for making your research actionable. If we have to read your paper and go to the place and like download the data and clean it, we already stopped. We never even started, right? But if we have an API that has some instructions, we'll use it, right? So another thing we'll do is we're going to be releasing our own Ava API so that we can really enable all the people that we can collaborate with, all the people who build uh, all these panels and start, install batteries, and uh, they have charging stations and electric vehicles. So all the vendors that we work with us, um, they'll have access to our API for us to enable seamless data exchange, which is really critical on this space. So I really want to emphasize this. It's super important to know about even though it might not be a priority for you at the moment. Yeah, so in terms of machine learning applications, um, one of the main areas um, revolves around time series data, time series consumption, and how we identify signals for that. And a couple of use cases um, for those uh, signals is one, operations and planning, and the other one is energy efficiency and demand response. So operations and planning, we're required to provide um, day ahead, short-term load forecasts um, to be scheduled for how much um, demand we expect um, our service territory to have the next day. Um, and depending on how accurate we are, then we'll have to make up the difference or we would have to maybe sell at a lot or we would have bought at a loss depending on the real time uh, market prices. Um, and so those can have, you know, large financial impact. So it's very critical to have a very um, accurate short-term load forecasting for our daily operations. And one of the ways we do that is to um, create a uh, XGB, um, you know, machine learning model to to generate a day ahead forecast every day, um, up to five days in advance. Um, and right now we're doing um, very well. Um, we had used to outsource that um, to a third party vendor, 
Um, that vendor ended the contract. And so we thought it might be a good time to bring that um, use case in-house um, so that we're not beholden to um, external forces. And so far um, it's been, it took a while, it took almost a year to develop, but um, right now it's performing um, very, very well and, and uh, very consistent. Um, the other um, big application for time series um, interval uh, usage is being able to disaggregate um, home appliances at the customer level. Um, and we're using hourly um, uh, interval data, so we couldn't get too deep into um, uh, specific appliances. We had to stay at kind of the larger appliances like AC, um, um, electric heating, and, and some water, water heaters. Um, but we also applied uh, some machine learning algorithms like um, k-means to to generate load shapes for AC um, AC users, um, and and use that towards demand response um, initiatives. Um, on the other side of the application are our customers. Um, so that one was more focused on kind of time series, um, interval consumption data. We also can apply machine learning um, towards um, customer targeting and program creation. And the customer targeting involves uh, social demographics data. And these are the building blocks for, for how we can identify uh, customers that we want to target specific programs to. Uh, and this involves income, um, household size, uh, home ownership. Uh, currently, we have a model right now that um, predicts low, medium, high income um, from all the various attribute data that we have from our customer, as well as uh, aggregated um, consumption data. Those pieces of data will then kind of feed into a more advanced level of program creation, um, where we're not being reactive to, to kind of our customers' problems, but we're being proactive, um, being able to segment customers who um, often get disconnected for non-payment, um, who are our customers that are more eco-conscious um, versus energy indifferent? What kind of programs can we design and create to kind of um, move the energy and different customers um, towards a certain behavior to change their load, um, to change their load profiles, uh, stuff like that. So we are really actively embedding the machine learning um, tools into um, our customer programs, into our daily operations. So it's starting to be a very big cornerstone um, into how we operate. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. I think one of the things that Kevin has been doing a great job at is turning uh, machine learning into something that is really programmatic and useful. An example of this is the low disaggregation of the cooling load, which if you told this to anyone, it sounds like really boring, but in reality, it's really practical. We had a couple of really extreme heat days last year and they're coming. And we, for example, didn't, before Kevin developed the model, uh, we did not have a sense of all the households in our territory that had a cooling load, right? So when you ask, who do I send a signal to, to avoid having the grid having a blackout, who do I engage with? Thanks to this machine learning model, we were able to actively recruit them and significantly be able to move load around in the day to avoid having some uh, grid issues that we actually avoided. And we did a, we did a backcast analysis, and the response in the model had a big big deal to do with that. So that that's all we have for now. We have some time for questions.